Good morning, everyone. That's a beautiful day. Well, it was a beautiful day when we came in. I'm not sure what it might be like when we go uh, out. Um, so, welcome everyone. I don't think we have any uh, guests or visitors this morning, but uh, they're always uh, welcome. And if you're watching online, welcome to you, to you and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm not into social media. I don't know the difference between a Twitter and a Twitter or whatever it is, and a, an Instagram and a Telegram. But the thing about I think YouTube's brilliant, and I mean you can join with us in an act of worship and fellowship, you at home and us here. We're all the one congregation. So we start with our invitation to worship, and it will all be on the screen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Sing to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. The Lord is our light and our life. I forgot to mention that I'm leading the service, but Andrew's doing the preaching. Oh, I see him at the back. He's getting in a panic there. <laughs> Couldn't see where Andrew was. Well, we'll come to our, our first hymn. Uh, I love hymns that use the words of the Bible. And our first hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, it's from Lamentations 3.23. It's written way back in 1922 in America. Another example of the international church. Great is Thy Faithfulness.
beautiful hymn. We come to quite an important part of the, the service, our confession. I'm sure like me, nobody's robbed a bank this week. Or we think, I'm okay this week. But, you know, I'm sure you like, you're like me. I, I would slip up sometimes. And I was just thinking, um, earlier in the week, uh, a friend of mine sent me an email to say that she'd broken her arm. And of course, I sent sympathy. But I made a wee, a wee joke. And the next morning, I thought, crikey. Maybe I'm trivialising this broken arm, the girl can't drive. So I sent her another email right away and apologised and she came back. Oh, he says, don't worry, I thought that was a great joke. Oh, thank goodness. But, you know, sometimes they can say things that could be hurtful and often they don't realise it. Maybe I, have, I haven't been as well behaved this week as I thought. So well, this gives me a chance to bring myself before the Lord. Let's just sit a few seconds, reflect on the, the week and maybe the week ahead, and then we'll say the penitence together. And we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The collect for today. As you know, every Sunday there's a collect and it moves through the church year and it's a good part of the liturgy because again, it can focus our mind collect for today. O oh God, form the minds of your faithful people that we may love what you command and desire what you promise, so that amid the many changes of this world, our hearts may be there fixed upon you, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We're coming to the reading, and I have brought my Bible up. So the screen will go blank, I'll go and get my Bible. As you can see, I've got a big black Bible. My granny always said, the bigger the Bible, the bigger the hypocrite. So, <laughs> hopefully I'm not too bad. As you know, we're following the journey of the Apostles after the appearance of the risen Christ. And Christ went to, to heaven, but gave his Holy Spirit to us to guide us. Acts 15, 1 to 11. It's the Council at Jerusalem. This was a vital council. If it had fallen apart, the early church would have been badly damaged. I'm sure Andrew will be talking about that. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. 
This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the, of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God <clears throat> by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Irvine, uh, for leading and also for the reading. Uh, so, Roy Griffith, who's um, our computer genius, uh, sent me uh, an amazing cartoon during the week. And if you can picture it, there's a, a child and it looks like a teacher and a blackboard or a whiteboard. And there's um, five dashes do for five letters. And the, the last three um, dashes have been completed, V, I, D. And the teacher is asking the child, who killed Goliath? And the answer is, you're saying David. The child answers, COVID. And the caption underneath says, we need to get back to Sunday school. Um, so this isn't actually part of the sermon, but I just want to let you know that we are uh, considering how we uh, restart a children's ministry. And maybe if you're watching at home and you've got young children, you're thinking that it might be quite difficult to come along to a service with them. Um, we are trying to work out how we restart a children's ministry. And there's different things we've put in place already. So at the minute, there's a little activity pack um, for, for children during the service and also a packet of sweets. Um, that has to be eaten by the children, by the way. Parents, they're not to be shared with you. Um, and we are going to begin in a few weeks, or maybe even next week, um, sort of children's talks and so on, and just to make it um, more accessible for young families to, to come along and be part of us. Um, but in the long term, we do want to have uh, a children's ministry that children can come along, be part of our congregation, but also to maybe go out and spend time together and with, with leaders. So that's just so you know. We'd, we'd love you to pray for that as well and pray for guidance and wisdom as we work out how uh, we do that. A number of years ago, I was working in a church and my role there was specifically um, working with young adults, so that's people who are 18, into their 20s and into their 30s. There was a guy who started to come along and he hadn't been to a church for four or five years. The reason he hadn't been to church is that he left his previous church over uh, the treatment of his, his brother. Um, so something had gone on and um, how his brother had experienced that. Um, led them to leave church as a family. So four or five years later, this guy in his early 20s had started to come along to our church. He would walk 30, 35 minutes there, 30, 35 minutes back again, and to be at the church service. Uh, one day it was icy cold, and as the service finished, he put on his, his gloves and his hat um, in order to go home. And one of the men in the church came to him and pointed and says, men don't wear hats in this church, some I'm going to let that sit with you uh, for a while. As Irvine said, we are uh, back in the book of Acts. We, we looked at the first half of the book of Acts in January and February. Uh, we had a break to look at the Easter story and uh, what happened following that. And we're back in, starting at Acts 15. Um, and the question we ask as we look at this history of the early church was a number of questions. One is, what can we learn as a church as to how we be the church? And also, what can we learn as individuals and as families about how we live out our faith? So where we've got to so far in the story is that Jesus has died, he's been resurrected, 
He commissions his disciples uh, to be the church. Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit falls uh, upon his followers. The church is formed and established. The word of God spreads and people come to faith. Peter has this vision and an encounter that shows him that the gospel is for everyone, not just the Jewish people. Saul, uh, who becomes Paul, who's the chief persecutor, is converted. Uh, evangelism happens through him and through others. And more churches are established and more and more further afield, particularly amongst the Gentiles, as Paul and others travel to spread the gospel. So we get to chapter 15 in the book of Acts, and it's described as a pivot point in the book. It's the start of the second half, and it sets a direction for the book and also for the church. And also, if you look at the first half of Acts, you see a lot of it is focused around Peter. From now on, it seems to be focused around uh, Paul. So you have this interaction, um, this council uh, that, that Irvine uh, talked about, um, this gathering of the leaders of the church. And there's a number of points I think we see in the reading, three things I think we can learn. The first is this, um, to be aware or to beware of false uh, teaching. The, the reading starts with some men or other versions say certain people and I think in um, circumstances like this is always a certain uh, people. In the story I told about the young guy who came to church, there was a certain uh, person. In this case, it's, uh, it's a group of people called the Judaizers. Um, these are Jewish converts, they've converted to Christianity. And if you, if you want some extra reading to do, if you read the book of Galatians, that letter, Paul writes a letter to the church in Galatia, and he's talking about this very uh, topic, and you see how it links in uh, with this, and he actually goes into more detail about the issue than we can read in, in today's uh, reading in this account. So if you want to read um, the book of Galatians, you'll get a, a bit more information, a bit more background, and you also see how the letters in the New Testament uh, tie in with uh, the story in Acts. Um, but these Judaizers um, are teaching something that is incorrect. Um, so because of that, they're false teachers because they're teaching falsehood. What they're teaching is a Jesus plus gospel. What it means is that in order to come to faith, in order to experience salvation, you need to put your trust in Jesus and do something else. Their plus was Jewish customs. If you converted to Judaism in those days, you were expected to be circumcised and to follow the law of Moses. And this was the outward sign of your conversion to Judaism. So these Jewish converts were saying, well, Gentiles, if you're converted to Christianity, and Christianity is actually just a sect, a segment of Judaism, so you need to also follow the Jewish customs in order to be saved. And this is the, the, um, the, the issue that we are looking at. This is the issue that the council meets to discuss um, if people convert, and they're not Jewish people, but they convert to Christianity, must we also expect that they follow the Jewish customs? So they have to convert to Christianity, but in doing that, word, they're also converting to Judaism. These people aren't necessarily bad people. They're converted Pharisees. And um, because they've converted from being a Pharisee, and because they put their trust in Jesus, they're likely to have been um, disowned by their families and their friends. They'll be shunned, um, lost income, lost livelihood, maybe even lost um, their homes. So they're not necessarily bad people, but what they've done is to, to allow their culture, their heritage, their background and their traditions to cloud their understanding of the gospel. And they then put that onto others. This is incorrect as we read the scriptures. This is false uh, teaching. As an image is going to come up of a, a church in the jungle. This is in the Amazon uh, rainforest. Um, Christian uh, missionaries had made their way through the jungle. They reached these indigenous tribes and they taught them the gospel. They communicated the gospel. People have put their trust in Jesus. So they built the church and in the church you'll find a church organ and pews and all the other trappings of a British church. What they said is come to Jesus and put your trust in Jesus, but you also must worship the way that we do. Another slide is going to come up. It's a picture of Hudson Taylor, who is a famous missionary to China. 
He's famous, um, one, because so many people came to faith through his ministry, but whenever he arrived, he discovered that the missionaries who were already there were dressed as Westerners, and they behaved as Westerners, and they lived as Westerners, and they communicated the gospel, and as Chinese people came to faith, they were expected then to behave like the Westerners. Hudson Taylor decided that he was going to dress as a Chinese man, and he was going to live as a Chinese man, and he was going to assume the Chinese culture as a Christian. What the other missionaries were um, communicating is a gospel of Jesus plus Britishness, Jesus plus our culture. And some historians reckon that a lot of the persecution that the church experiences now in China is part of because of this. And um, because they said that one more Christian equals one less Chinese person. Because whenever a Chinese person converted to Christianity, they also converted away from being a Chinese person. Convert to Jesus and put your trust in him, and it's Jesus plus our culture. In Northern Ireland, I'm sure there's other things uh, that we have and that we expect of people, and that you should dress a certain way, and do you become a Christian, but you must dress a certain way uh, to come uh, to church. So it can be either dressed formally, that's how you need to dress to come to church, or you go to other churches close to here, and if you're not wearing jeans and a t-shirt, you'll look out of place. So come to our church, but assume the culture that we have here. Look like us, dress like us, and behave like us. Whenever I first became a Christian, it was in the mid-1990s, and the, what you wore as a, a young person to come to church then was a Ben Sherman shirt, a Czech Ben Sherman shirt, a pair of Levi 501 jeans. No other jeans were acceptable um, to wear to church, and a pair of Kicker's shoes. Um, or caterpillar boots. Now, you maybe don't understand what they were, but that's what you wore as a Christian um, in your late teens, in the mid-90s. You dressed a certain way, so you put your trust in Jesus, and you also assumed the culture of the congregation. I'm sure years ago, and maybe even closer to today, um, you'll, you'll have heard that for Christians, you shouldn't go to the cinema. Do you know it's wrong for Christians to go to the cinema. I remember hearing about a protest about line dancing. Um, everybody in that picture, if you look closely, you can see it. Um, a protest about line dancing because line dancing is sinful. Now, I wouldn't protest about line dancing because it's sinful. I would protest because it's country music and that is just wrong um, and it shouldn't be allowed to happen. But we assume, we believe, well, that's, that's sinful, that's wrong, we shouldn't do that. Another thing that happened whenever I became a Christian is that I was told, well, you shouldn't listen to music, it's not Christian music. You should only listen to Christian uh, music. So I got rid of a lot of, of my music and that wasn't Christian uh, music. The problem we have is that when we add to the gospel and when we add expectations that are either wrong or aren't quite correct, it's false teaching, it's incorrect, it's not accurate teaching from um, from what we understand of the gospel and the Bible. Sometimes they're bad things, sometimes they're not bad things, but we communicate to people, put your trust in Jesus, plus behave like us, live like us, assume our culture. But what does God say um, about this? Um, what do we understand about how we live uh, correctly? Because we want to know, well, how, if I'm telling you that we should be aware of false teaching, how do we know that something is accurate? Well, the answer is we go uh, to God. So in this encounter, you see that Peter um, refers to his prophetic experience where God communicates with him and tells him that Gentiles might hear from his lips the message of the gospel and believe. So Peter has heard from God. The most important thing I think we can do is to go to the scriptures. Because the question I ask someone, if they say, well, you need to behave a certain way, I'll ask, well, is this in the scriptures? Is this written in the Bible? You Christians shouldn't go to the cinema. So automatically, I don't think, well, that's right or wrong. I think, well, let me read what the scriptures tell me. And obviously, they don't speak about cinema and specifically because it didn't exist. But is there something I can learn in the Bible about what I do with my, with my um, hobbies, with my spare uh, time? 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says that all scripture is God-breathed or it's inspired by God and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting 
and training in righteousness. Well, why? So that the servant of God, which is us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want to know how to live out my faith I go to the scriptures. If someone puts an expectation on me, I maybe don't decide there and then if it's, if it's right or wrong. I say, what does the scripture say? Back to that man in the story I told you to start. Men shouldn't wear hats in church. Well, let me read what the scriptures say about that. Do they talk about that even? And if not, well, it's just a cultural expectation that this man has put in the young guy who came into our church. So if I want to know what's expected, go to the scriptures. I can also listen to the voice of God uh, in prayer in a different ways. Ask God to help me, to guide me, and to instruct me. God, I'm hearing that there's this expectation. I'm hearing that there's something I need to do to live out my faith. Um, I'm not really clear about it from scriptures. Can you speak to me? Can you inspire me? Can you help me understand uh, what is right and what's expected? The second point that we see uh, in the encounter and in our reading is that stories of convergence should, should make us glad. Jesus told the parable of vineyard workers and uh, the vineyard owner employs um, workers at different times of the day. So he employs some first thing in the morning then some later in the morning, then some into the afternoon. Then some only work for an hour or so. And then they get their, their pay for the day and everyone gets paid the same. The ones who'd worked early in the day, earlier in the day or were employed from then are saying, like, that's not fair. Do we've worked more than them? We deserve more than they do. They don't deserve to be paid the same as us. And Jesus was teaching the parable and to get at people's attitudes around salvation because sometimes we think that we are more worthy than others to achieve or to experience salvation and sometimes we think that we're not worthy enough and compared it to others sometimes we'll hear someone comes to faith and we'll say hey don't you know how bad they are don't you know what they've done don't you know what they're like or don't don't you know how bad i am don't you know what i've done and what i'm like sometimes we'll say well this church is for us and people like us. So we expect that people who come along to our church look like us, behave like us. And we separate into different types. Um, we we'll say like, I'm this type of person, that person's that type of person. Or also, or we'll separate by hierarchy, where we'll say that and that person is, is beneath me, or I'm beneath that person. I'm more worthy than them of the grace of God, or I'm not as worthy is them of the grace of God. Elsewhere, Paul writes in Galatians, he said this. He says, in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ um, and clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. God doesn't see us as different. When we separate, whenever we split ourselves into types of people, God doesn't see that. He doesn't see the different backgrounds when it comes to salvation. He doesn't see um, one person is any better or any worse um, or any more deserving or less deserving than another. Sometimes we say, well, our church is going to be a middle class church or our church is going to be a working class church or our church is going to become a church for younger generations or our church is going to be a church for not for the younger generations or in different places we say our church is going to be for a specific ethnic group but the reading says there's neither this nor that we're all one we're all the same see the gospel's for everyone god doesn't discriminate his desires for all to hear and to come to faith we should rejoice and be glad when we hear stories of people coming to faith regardless of who they are or where they've come from jesus tells another story and um, the story of the lost coin he says imagine a woman who has 10 coins and loses one would she light a lamp and scar the house looking at every nook and cranny until she finds it and when she finds it you can be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors so say, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. It's from the message translation. Count on it. 
That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. So God's angels celebrate every time someone turns to God. Every single time. If you put your trust in Jesus at some time in your life, the angels celebrated and threw a party. I think that's quite cool uh, to imagine. So heaven rejoices when one person comes to faith. So our desire, if we want to be authentic followers of Jesus, is that we should be glad and we should rejoice whenever someone comes to faith. And if we choose to have that sort of attitude, that we will rejoice if someone comes to faith, we will build a desire to want to see that happen. You know, if we are excited about people coming to faith, if we choose to be excited about that, our desire will grow to want to see people come to faith. So think of your family members, think of your friends, think of your neighbours who don't know Jesus. You know, how excited would you be if they put their trust in him? The final point uh, that we see is that um, they teach that salvation only comes through faith in Jesus. And a slide's going to come up of a burger and I'm not going to tell you what that's to do with um, for another couple of minutes, but I'm going to put it there just to tempt you a wee bit. Um, so Peter says, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we're saved. Jesus in John 14 um, said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way to come to God except through faith in Jesus. You can go through the scriptures, you can read every single part of the Bible, and you'll not find another way that you can come to faith um, to, uh, to God, come to a relationship with God, except by going through Jesus and putting your trust in him. So in this, in Acts 15, we're seeing that they're saying, well, it's Jesus plus Jewish customs. In Northern Ireland, it's maybe Jewish, or Jesus plus behave a certain way, dress a certain way, act a certain way. And we think, if, if I attend enough, you know, I'll get in. Um, or if I pay enough, like I can pay my way in. Or if I, if I behave um, my way in, if I'm good living, like a lot of people are. Um, the reason I put a picture of a burger up is because uh, there's a Christian musician in the 80s, I think called Keith Green, who was a speaker as well and a writer. And he says that do a lot of people believe that by doing the right thing and just going to church, do you know, then you become a Christian. He says that's like thinking that um, if, you, if you go to McDonald's enough, you'll become a hamburger. It's a ridiculous way of thinking. Or we do it through religion. We follow the religious things that we need uh, to do. And in the Anglican Church, we have things that we do to express our faith and to show what's happening on the inside. Um, in a previous job, I worked um, as a youth development officer around Ireland, the Church of Ireland. And I hear stories of, of young people, 12 and 13 year olds, going through confirmation. And you ask them, well, you've you gone through confirmation because you put your trust in Jesus and say, well, no, my granny's given me a hundred quid. Like, well, I would do it for a hundred quid. Others, well, granny's buying me an iPad, but get myself confirmed. I can hear a 12 year old and you're offered an iPad, you're going to do it. Do you hear stories of things like this? You ask, well, do you have, have you put your trust in Jesus? No, I'm not interested in that, but I want to be confirmed. And we have a wrong understanding of the religious things that we do. They're an outward expression of something that's happened on the inside. They're not something that we do on the outside to earn salvation because it doesn't work. We read it. The only way you can be saved is by putting your trust in Jesus. In Galatians 2, it says this, Paul writes this, a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified or made right, made right with God by faith in Christ. Not by the works of the law, so the things that we do, because though by the works of the law, no one will be justified. The only way we can be saved is by putting our trust and faith in in Jesus Christ. The only way others can be saved is by putting their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. The gospel isn't put your trust in Jesus plus the other things. Salvation can be achieved in no other way. This is quite a challenging passage. As Irvine said, this was a really crucial 
event that happened in the history of the church and it set the direction of the church that and when jesus says that the gospel will, will be communicated to the ends of the earth if it was limited if they had said well actually yes people can come to faith but they have to put the trust in jesus plus the jewish culture and customs it would have ended the spread of the gospel but thankfully the disciples and the apostles they were godly people and they prayed and they heard god's voice and they went to scriptures and they knew that it's just jesus you put your faith and your trust in jesus and that's how uh, we are saved so as we uh, draw this to a close let's take a few moments just to reflect on that let's um, allow the holy spirit to illuminate something in us uh, maybe um do you've been challenged about expectations that we put so we as as a parent you know we've got the the two girls we have to be really careful with the expectations we put on them you know if i say that girls you need to put your trust in jesus but you need to dress a certain way to come to church you need to behave a certain way to come to church and um, then i'm doing the same as the pharisees did so i have a, a responsibility as a parent i have a responsibility as someone trying to share my faith with others not to put not to add on things into the gospel but i believe that there's also sometimes where we have things added on to us and we're um doing certain things and believing certain things because someone's communicated to us something that's not accurate and it's not true so it's false so we go to scriptures and we go to god and we ask him to advise us and what's your attitude to someone coming to faith do you, do you anticipate with joy and excitement and gladness that someone would come to faith regardless of who they are what they look like how they behave and we need to know that the only way to come to faith is by putting our trust in jesus that's what we're called to do so the extra things that we think we need to do we don't actually need to do them they're an outworking of what's happening on the inside what happens on the outside and um, doesn't cause what's happening on the inside what's happening on the inside causes what's happening on the outside so let's take a few moments and um, to pray holy spirit I ask that you would speak to us illuminate and um, what it is that you want each of us um, to think about in particular is there one specific thing for each of us to think about is there one application uh, for each of us Father God, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that is found in you. We thank you that we can't do anything to achieve it, but it's a gift and because of the sacrifice of Jesus. To help us to celebrate our own faith, help us to celebrate that we're forgiven, help us to celebrate that we've experienced your grace. Give us a desire to see others come to faith in you. Give us an attitude that will celebrate and rejoice and be glad when we see that happening. And help us to communicate the gospel without the, um, the additions, without the, the pluses. Help us to communicate your gospel. continue our prayers. Dear Lord, we bring the Queen before you. We thank you for her wonderful witness of faith over the decades. And we thank you for her decades of service. Perhaps the outstanding example of, of servanthood to the country although she's in a very high social position, <coughs> she has been a servant to others. We just ask, Lord, your Holy Spirit will be with her 
in the lonely nights in the weeks and months ahead. And we know, Father, that within our church family, we have people who also have to endure lonely nights. And we ask it. They will feel the touch of your Holy Spirit. We ask it. They will feel the presence of Jesus. So they know that he is with them. And they are not alone. And we thank you, Lord, for the miraculous development of vaccinations. It's, it's astonishing that the scientists have been able to develop these vaccinations so quickly. We thank you for the production of them. And we thank you for the amazing rollout, particularly in this country, of the vaccination program. <clears throat> But we're very conscious, Lord, of those who are suffering in other countries. I saw a chap on TV in India who was saying there's hardly family in India who doesn't know somebody who's died from COVID or who's in, within their family. We just don't understand about this evil disease that's rampant around the world. But we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be on the vaccination programs. We ask that the Western countries will take your guidance as how the, the vaccination should be spread around the world. And we give thanks, Lord, that we are starting to come back to normal. Even the simple things, Lord, that going out for a coffee or going out shopping, we get enjoyment and pleasure from. We just Thank you and praise you for the, the good lifestyle that we have. But we ask that uh, you will guide the politicians and all in society in wisdom as we come out of our restrictions. Help us to be sensible, Lord, and particularly young people going to music venues. May they be conscious of responsibilities to others. We bring before you, Lord, Roy Brennan, who some of us know, who was the, the pastor of the Crossroads Church, and he took seriously ill, I think it was Friday night. And we ask you, your hand will be upon him, that you will comfort him, his family, and all his friends. And we just pause for for all of us to bring before God those whom we have love and concern for. And we ask that those of you at home will join us, all of us here, as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. I think if you're able to just stand for the affirmation. If you want to sit, please remain uh, seated. But for me, this is very important. So please stand for affirmation. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're moving into our final hymn. I've mentioned before that I first heard this song way back in 1984, when I was 17. <clears throat> Sorry, Lord. I heard 
heard this hymn back in 1984 at Aston Villa's ground in Birmingham. It was during the big Billy Graham uh, uh, visit to the UK and the, the Anglican Church organised it all. And if you've been in a football stand, not to cheer a particular team, but 30,000 people singing together, Majesty, worship His Majesty. It's amazing. I can still feel the hairs in the back of my head. Awesome experience for me. I'll never forget it. And also, a friend came to Christ at that rally, and I was a bit like the person up on the screen there. My friend has come to Christ. So let's join in Majesty, worship His Majesty. Please be seated. Some of us almost worship football teams, rugby teams, and sometimes we get a bit depressed. But I try to say to myself, this is nonsense. There is something far, far more important than football or rugby. I was talking about Aston Villa. <coughs> it reminded me of a uh, a certain team. Now, I, I'm, I'm not being biased here, but you'll know there's a, a team with the song, You'll Never Walk Alone. I sing that rapturously, not just for my team, but I think it's a brilliant hymn. You will never walk alone. And as Christians, we never walk alone. Announcements. You can't leave without announcements. When I was looking at the photograph up there and I thought, when COVID is over, maybe it'd be nice if Andrew could organise and teach us line dancing. <laughs> and just say, or even not Jewish dancing up. up. <laughs> I once petrified the minister by asking him, wouldn't it be a great idea if the Mullers Union started a sacred dance troupe? Poor chap panicked. I was trying to get him to agree to, agree to a youth event, 
And he quickly agreed to that. <laughs> anyway, if you look at the back of the church and you saw coming in, it's a, and you at home can't see it, but it's amazing how many items have been brought in for the larger food bank. We are a generous church. Praise the Lord. But as Andrew has mentioned, the larder is not just for Newton Arch Road, it's for East Belfast. So if you, if you know of someone who's in need and could be helped by the, the larder, please speak to Andrew. And our online Bible study continues. Andrew will send out our weekly church notice by email. Amazing. So you'll be very welcome to join us. Uh, Andrew will send out the login uh, details. Um, it's very informal and relaxed. I know it might be a bit awkward for, for some of us, but you don't have to ask a question. You can just sit there. There's a fair bit of crack uh, as well. It's a good way to get together. Um, we learn a lot from our Bible study. And it's Christian Aid Week, 10th to 16th of May. It'll be different this year. So we'll be communicating ways you can get involved. Uh, by email or social media but we'll tell you that next week's service and there'll be a special offering towards the work of Christian Aid Sunday 16th of May and next week Andrew will continue our series in Acts and don't forget families are very very welcome uh, some daddies might be a bit jealous of the wee sweetie or whatever that's in the welcome pack. So, if daddies want something to suck during the sermon, we will provide an extra children's activity pack for any of the fathers who need it. I can see a couple of people putting their hands up here. So, finally, there's baskets at the back for the feed. We'll and we come to our dismissal. But this prayer reminds me of the video at the beginning where the people of different backgrounds were singing on the street. And God was with them in the cafes, on the streets, in the football grounds, in the shops. God is always with us because he is a faithful and we say together our dismissal. Grant, O Lord, that as we leave this house, we may not leave your presence. Be ever near us and keep us close to you now and forever. Amen. And a particular thanks to those of us, to those of us, it is us, and to those of you who have joined us on YouTube. The blessing. The Lord be with you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ.